Well, welcome everybody. This is Dr. Mark Hyman. I'm the director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. I'm here with a colleague and friend, Dr. Ari Roca, who comes to us from Little Rock, Arkansas, and is going to tell us about the world of pain. Uh, he's a family doctor, integrative and functional medicine doctor, does acupuncture, hypnotherapy, and many other modalities, and has really pioneered a revolutionary way of thinking about how we can treat pain in a very new way. We know pain is a big issue. We know the opiate crisis is exploding. We know there's 70,000 deaths a year from opiate overdose, and we really have not solved the pain problem, except it seems like with Dr. Roca in Little Rock, Arkansas. So welcome. Uh, and thank you because you just did a great Grand Rounds here at Cleveland Clinic and was uh, very eye-opening for many people. We had the head of pain here, or pain management, I shouldn't say the head of pain. That sounds like a, <laughs> a bad torture problem. But we, we really are um, often barking up the wrong tree when it comes to addressing pain, which is using medications and maybe psychotherapy and a few little modalities here and there. But you've pioneered a really revolutionary way of both thinking about the kind of healing that has to happen and the approach to it, as well as mm -hmm. the delivery model, which is how we deliver care, which is not, let's say, one-on-one, -on -one, which we think of as a traditional medical care, which is a doctor office visit where you get to see the doctor and you go home with a prescription. This is completely revolutionized. So tell us about how this works at the VA, which is a challenging population to start with, you know, and, and two, uh, how how your experience has been in developing this program and what it actually is for uh, for for these patients and what the, what they experience. So thanks, Mark, for having me. And and you know we can begin the conversation with something you said in that introduction, right? Pain management. So when we name pain and put management next to it, it sort of creates the entire system. It summarizes it in just those two words: pain management. So we don't ever talk about pain management. We talk about therapies that address pain. Ah. And so it is not our responsibility to manage a person's pain, to suppress a person's pain. Now, of course, we're going to have an eye toward doing that. But the expectation when you say those words is, I have this experience, it's your job to fix it. Yeah. Right? And that has not worked. It's got us in the challenge that we face it's today. Not what we do. It's not what we do to them, it's what they do for themselves. It's not what we do to them. Though the entire system creates the situation where people presume I have a problem, you fix it. You, the medical system, fixes it. So for us, what we work to do is we work to, to shift that and say, what can you do for your situation to get yourself back into your life? How can we reverse what is reversible and how can you work to retrain your body so that you get more capacity out of your life. Mm -hmm. What we see happens with pain, and we ask our, our veterans this, is anybody in the room better off for having had pain? Most people, no, not at all. It's taken their life away little by little by little by little. We can think of it as almost like amputating one's life mm -hmm. so that one's primary relationship is with pain, not with the people they love, not with their spirituality, not with nature, not with anything that's important to them. Mm -hmm but with that experience. They check in on it in the morning, they check in throughout the day, everything is relative to that experience. We have to get them out of that mindset and back into the mindset that there are things that I wanna do in life and how do I engage in those things even though I have this experience that is at times very uncomfortable. You know, there was an article recently in New York Times about the difference between um, pain as an emotion and pain as a physical experience. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I think there's two components we often don't separate, which is the physical sensation and then the yes. emotional meaning we attach to that sensation, which then creates the mindset of disability. Well, there are actually three pieces. So we differentiate between pain and sensation and then between pain and suffering. Mm. So pain and sensation, and, and right. pain, most... Pain may be there, but suffering is optional? Is that Suffering the idea? is optional. <laughs> suffering is totally optional. I mean, we suffer to the degree that we choose to have expectations that can't be met, to the degree that we choose to engage in the struggle. Mm -hmm. Suffering comes from the struggle, and that's a place of engagement. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have uncomfortable sensations, but then the question is, which sensations can you tolerate and which sensations do you retreat from? And that's the differentiation between sensation and pain. 
-hmm. And most individuals, when you ask them the question, and that's, that's how we do it, we don't tell them what this is. Say, in your experience, what's the difference between having a sensation that you can be with versus having a sensation that you define as pain that you work to escape from? Making that differentiation is a core foundation because very often when people catastrophize, and that happens, right? Every sensation becomes something to avoid. Yeah. And so you work to refine that and say, what can you move into? Because we're going to ask folks to move. And that's Slowly, a vicious cycle, right? If they are in pain and then they don't move, it creates even worse outcomes. That's right. You can sensitize so that you can feel more pain across more areas of the body and then you lose function because literally your brain is no longer communicating effectively with those areas of the body that you're no longer using maximally. So you have to retrain that connection. You have to retrain yourself to engage in movement and to have your brain literally communicate with your body parts to be able to do things that you used to be able to do that you can tolerate the sensation and work into it, not force it, never force it. This is not about forcing you to that point. That's about feeling the place where you wonder if you can sit with that sensation and then backing off. And then using mindfulness and breath and yogic techniques to then see if you can explore that edge. So it's moving into a space that is created as opposed to trying to force an outcome. Forcing outcomes don't work very well. But, but you approach this not just through helping people's mindset and their beliefs and their relationship on an emotional level to the pain, but you also change their biology through the power of food. Food and, and functional medicine, absolutely. Community and group mm -hmm. to change people's behavior and the power of lifestyle changes. And so it's, it's a, you talk about the bottom of the matrix. In functional medicine, we have the matrix, which is the fundamental lifestyle factors that are contributing to imbalances in the body that create disease and you really focus on that and you're not using heavy lab testing or supplements and you're finding extraordinary results in mm -hmm. these patients where often they're completely resistant to treatment and where you're overwhelmed with the VA you can't even accommodate all the patients that are there until you develop this group model that's exactly and it's right. the vehicle for delivering the content but it's also a way for people to actually change through the power of the group through the power of the group people support each other Right? This, we, we set up the group rules at the beginning. It's not a fixing group. It's not about people telling people what to do. It's about actually sharing what works for each individual. And it's about calling people on their stuff. Individuals yeah. in the group can do that way differently than we can as providers. And it keeps it real. It keeps people moving forward. And what's striking about what you do is, is, is that you, you have turned medical care upside down and said, you're not even going to see the doctor. You're going to, you're going to work with a health coach for nine weeks before you even get into the graduate group, which is another group, which isn't even seeing the doctor for six months or however long the program is. Well, it's nine weeks, and then you get to see an individual provider, whether that's the physical therapist, the dietitian, the psychologist, APN, or MD. So once you finish the nine weeks, then you see individual providers and you do the advanced groups. But the nine weeks is, is all about health coaching and about skills building. Which many of those people don't even need to see a provider after that because they're better. After that, they'll say, why am I here? Because according to how they assess themselves in their life, they've gotten what they expected to get out of it. Now, sometimes we can add some additional nuances and, and even help people to improve further. But, but very often, they don't see the need for it. They'll be like, hey, we're doing pretty well. How powerful is the food part? Because um, essential, yeah, absolutely essential. We can't do this without dealing with nutrition. Food is the basis, the foundation. The way we discuss it is is from a functional nutrition point of view. Food is information. If you want to communicate wellness to your cells to help your cells heal, you need to give them the foods that are conducive to cellular healing. If you don't do that, then you are communicating to your cells that you want them to be diseased, dysfunctional, and to die early. Mm. And that is a choice. Mm. And you volunteer for that choice by literally feeding yourself and your cells information. Mm. So we want you, we, to, we encourage folks to feed themselves their cells healing information. And that is transformative for people yeah. to hear that language. Yeah. They're used to thinking about food as nutrition and, and you know, whether or not it's going to cause weight gain and, and this, this energy out, energy in kind of equation. Mm -hmm. 
they're not used to thinking about it as information in and information out, that we are changing your genes and how they express themselves by having the food you eat communicate that to your cells. Yeah, it's so powerful. I just saw a few papers who were published recently looking at rheumatoid arthritis and mm -hmm. diet and diet quality, uh, not even a functional medicine approach, but just the overall quality of the diet. And it was dramatically impactful in terms of their pain and their inflammation. And, dramatically. Uh, and yet it's, so, it's such a complete outlier in medicine. We don't. And so what are some of those drivers? I mean, we know that unhealthy fats can drive that, but that's not the biggest driver, is it? Sugar, carbs. Yeah. Simple carbs, having sweet tea, a, having sweet tea, having a dysfunctional insulin response, that is the primary driver. So much of the driver of pain, not all of it, of course, but a lot of the driver of pain has to do with cardiometabolic processes and the inflammatory consequences of those dysfunctional processes. Yeah, so essentially insulin resistance, people think of as driving weight gain, diabetes, cardiometabolic risk factors, heart disease. But it turns out it's a big driver of inflammation, it activates all the inflammatory cytokines. In fact, the visceral fat is full of adipocytokines, which exactly. are driving inflammation like IL-1, IL-6, TNF-alpha, all of which drive this chronic inflammatory process that mm -hmm. contributes to the pain. And, and you're and shutting that off. It helps your... to sensitize people to the pain. And when you are producing excessive or dysfunctional insulin regulation, then you're also encouraging nerves to sprout. Mm. It's a growth signal. So you're encouraging nerves to sprout around those areas where they're already under challenge. And of course, that's one of the reasons why the gabapentinoids work, because they, they inhibit that process. And so you're leading to this idea of pain sensitization and ex, um, expanding the, the region that is feeling pain more acutely. Now you, you focused on pain, but it seems to me that you know, you're seeing a lot of other benefits from this in your population group. Absolutely. You're not just trusting their pain. Other diseases improve, medication needs get less. Tell us about that. And so when we see folks, their ticket into the process is chronic pain. So that's just their ticket into the process. However, this process, by helping people become more resilient, working at the foundation of the matrix, the bottom of the matrix, um, helps people become resilient to all of these disease processes. So we will see people come off of their anti-rheumatologic agents. We'll see people's MS improve. We'll see people who have early pseudo-ALS, they can't quite get the diagnosis, actually stabilize their symptomatology. These are big things. We'll see people's cardiometabolic processes improve. They can come down on their medications, sometimes come off of their medications. We follow them to watch them do that. And as those things improve, very often, their sensations also improve. The VMS love you. You're saving them all sorts of money from medications, hospital visits, chronic, chronic diseases. And it really, it brings the, the question of, you focus on pain, but wouldn't this model make more sense in terms of the overall chronic disease epidemic, a coaching model followed by group models, followed by individual sessions as needed with a this specific This model works for any chronic disease. When we think of chronic disease, whether we think of cardiometabolic problems, inflammatory problems, whether we think of mental health challenges or of pain challenges, we're thinking about mental health situations, right? This is all about behavior. When we talk about focusing on the bottom of the matrix, we're talking about behavior change. As soon as we work into the realm of behavior, then we've entered into a mental health milieu. And so when we work in that kind of a place, Certainly we have to improve, we, ha we have to work to optimize the brain's capacity to make new connections, but that alone is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. What needs to happen when that happens, whether you're doing it with SSRIs, because that's the way SSRIs work, or whether you're doing it with increasing BD BDNF, whatever it is, then you need some ability to get feedback with your behaviors, talk therapy, or group process. Health coaching falls within that process of working through obstacles and challenges. There are different interventions on the same continuum. That is essential for behavior change to exist and to be consistent. And that's essential for chronic disease to be reversed. So you reverse whatever can be reversed. You replace deficiencies, you remove insults from the body, but you have to work in those places of behavior change around self-care, around the bottom of the matrix for people to actually take control over their health. If the healthcare system is to not implode on itself, 
self-care has to be a foundational building block for the future. Well, it's not been incentivized. At the VA, you have a unique environment because it's self-environment. It's sort of self-insured system, mm -hmm. and they're incentivized to be able to get patients better and not produce more care. It's a capitated population health-based system right. that more and more insurance companies are moving to on the outside. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so as we move to value-based care, as we move to population health, as we look at new forms of care delivery, Cleveland Clinic here now, there's been an innovation around care delivery models. Mm -hmm. There's a whole group that's looking at how do we innovate. And these kinds of models seem to me to be a powerful shift. And it's, it's a really paradigm shift for clinicians because you're used to seeing your patient in your office and that's medicine. We're saying that maybe huge. that is not the best way to take care of chronic disease. It is a huge paradigm shift. When it was an unintentional con uh, um, outcome that, that we noticed that individuals didn't really need to see a provider. Yeah. We did not anticipate that would be the outcome of the process. And it was a great learning moment for me, yeah. right? I've been trained as a conventional family yeah. medicine doctor. I thought I was important in the healing process mm -hmm. and that I was actually necessary for the healing yes. process. It might be irrelevant. <laughs> that, that, that's right, redundant, that it is not necessary. I mean, maybe in some cases, yeah. but generally it is not necessary when you turn the power back to the individual patient. When they take charge of their own health, things resolve. This is not unusual within the framework of functional medicine. Yeah. We know this to be true. Um, but it is very unusual given the way that medicine is continuing yeah. to evolve. Yeah, we, we see that here. We created a program called Functioning for Life, which is a group model of functional medicine, similar in some ways to the group model used for the VA. And what we found strikingly was that not only do people do well, but that their outcomes are better than the one-on-one -on -one visits with the same doctor in the group for the same diagnosis. It's not and, surprising. And not only that, half the people who go through the groups don't need to get an appointment. Yes. We entice them to come and say, well, if you do the group, you can get bumped up the wait list to see a provider. Mm -hmm. So they'll join. But it turns out after they join, they half of them don't even need to come see a physician. That's exactly true. And what often happens in those one-on-one -on -one visits is that there is a paternalism that exists yeah. where the provider from this place of expertise tells the person what they need to do to get better, which may not meet them in any place of their cultural experience, the individual patient. When we see our folks, the professionals in our group, we do everything from a health coaching perspective. So we have what we call a possibility conversation. We'll have a conversation saying all of the possible things that could be done. And, and you know, there are many when we're looking at returning a person to health. All the possible things that could be done. And the question is for them, where are you willing to begin? What are you willing to start with? And that is it. Yeah. So, you know, we put down however many or few, no more than three things that they are willing to begin to do. And then in follow-up, either with the individual practitioner, a dietitian, a health psychologist, or working within our more advanced groups, they continue to deepen that process. Every time they finish a group, they are invited to add things to what's called their personal health plan. And that is another innovation because a personal health plan is designed to be the wellness blueprint of all the individual's valued actions, the actions they choose to yeah. commit to. It's in the system. No, I think provider. we should do this. It's like oh, we never the, patient, put the, the patient is, I want right. to do this. We never put right. the I think you shoulds down there. It's like, okay, you have this home exercise program. Which pieces are you going to take into the future? You have all of these stretches that you can do. Which ones work best for you yeah. that you're willing to continue? And we get to continue to coach them into a more full expression of that. But the great thing is, no matter whether they see a dermatologist or a radiologist, somebody on the outpatient side or the inpatient side, that blueprint for wellness is there. Every single provider can reinforce those valued actions, which flips the entire system from a focus on symptoms to a focus on wellness. Now, this is a work in progress. Yeah, work I wish I could, you know, you could say that, oh, my goodness, they've already arrived. No, it's a work in progress. Yeah. But the system well, really exists to do that. So where can people learn more about your work and, and how to actually think about maybe incorporating this into their healthcare systems? 
Um, well, they can contact me. I presume the contact information will be there. There is the Office of Patient-Centered Care and Cultural Transformation at the VA, which holds this larger view for the entire system. And so that is a place that people can go as well. Great. And uh, if they, is there a website, for example, that shares about your work down at the VA in Little Rock? Um, there's a personal website that I have, and that is DrAnriRoca.com. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us thank from you, the Mark. clinic, and your work's very inspiring, and I think we're, we're just seeing the beginnings of this type of thinking and innovation around value-based care and population health, and it works at the VA. If it can work at the VA, it can work anywhere. You know that's true. You know that's true. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you.